Hello, I'm Rebecca. And I'm Natalie. And we're the founders of Frida Room. We're bad girls who want to do good things. You may be one yourself, you may know one, or you might like to become one. This podcast is not about handbags. This podcast series is about the journey to becoming Frida Rome, the trials and tribulations. So in this episode, which is part one of a three-part series, we'll be discussing the goings-on and the lead-up to starting Frida Rome, and basically how we burned our lives to the ground to start our dream business. We're going to wind back to 2018. We're walking down a dark back alley in Marrakesh. Mm -hmm. Natalie's looking at me and she's not looking very happy. (laughs) What were you thinking at that moment? Oh, gosh. There was a lot going on at that point in our lives. I had so much going on in my own personal life. Hated my job at this point. Hopefully your former employers aren't listening. (laughs) (laughs) My former employers do know me well. They probably knew how much of a stress it was. I didn't hate it so much as I felt like I'd fell into something that wasn't really the path I was meant to be on. So it sort of took a little bit of my soul away to think, I've just given up on my dream. Mm -hmm. And I let, but I kept myself going in that space. And then the pressures of real life and everything that comes with that partnership that turned into a marriage. As much as I love being married, there was a lot to that that was quite a heavy responsibility. It just got on top of me. And Mm -hmm. I was not where I wanted to be at that point in my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can remember your face. (laughs) (laughs) I want to know this point where I was. When I saw your face, Mm -hmm. it was full of absolute fear and Mm -hmm. almost, what have you done to me? So aside from the personal personal side of things and what was going on in the background, you'd had a bit of a run-in with (laughs) the border control. Yes, I did. You weren't happy about that. You thought you were going to get locked up. That expression that I was giving you and what you were seeing was how I was living at that point. Everything in my life at that stage was fear-focused. It was driven by fear. I was very anxious. And so anything that felt like I could be putting myself in danger was just so prevalent. It was like my amygdala was going mental because everything was based on fear. Mm -hmm. So it didn't matter that we were on holiday, which, you know, would normally be a highlight. It was, to me, the most fearful thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've known you for a long time. And, you know, we had a moment in Marrakesh where you had quite an anxious we we'll call it a breakdown. I don't know what you call it. Um, <laughs> an anxious episode. Yeah, anxious I would episode. say. And obviously, you know, a yeah. friend of ours commented that we were in a catch-22 because I had never really dealt with anybody with anxiety before. Mm. And I'm a very black and white character. And obviously, I took all the steps with the, with the wrong steps for someone who was having an anxious episode, which is everything's what you're talking about. And you're saying... I just need you to tell me that everything's going to be fine. Yeah, remember and that. then I refer to my logical and truthful side because I cannot tell a lie. I, I was obviously saying, yeah, I was saying to you, well, I obviously can't. I don't know that everything's going to be all right. I can't guarantee you that. I mean, what are we talking about? It's funny because I remember before realising that I had a little bit of anxiety about me, I knew friends that had this and they were very outspoken and would say, I am extremely anxious. So I had a housemate who said, I might come into your room in the middle of the night thinking I'm dying and I just need you to calm me down. And I was like, I've never heard of such a thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What I was experiencing was not, to me, anxiety because I thought it was way more extreme than what I was actually experiencing. Mm -hmm. But because of the general state in which I was living, it was so normal that I just thought that was just like everyday worrying. Like it was just... It was just what most people would experience. And admittedly, yeah, I do remember that moment of actually saying what I felt like I needed to hear, which was just tell me it's going to be all right. And I think that was just an accumulation. And not, (laughs) and you, but this is the other thing is that personally, I'm almost glad that you did do that because I think it brought me back down again to realise, well, yeah, that's stupid. It's like a rational thought. Yeah, well, it's how our mums and dads would have dealt with this. Yeah. You know, we both have a sort of, you're Southern, I'm Northern, but we have a similar upbringing where your family take the mick out of you. Yep. I don't know if mick is a global word. Take the mickey, yeah. US understand that? Australia? The, they would say take the piss. Sorry, but they would say take the piss. Fair enough. So we come from a culture where that happens regularly and you love it. Mm. 
So that was affection. That was affection. <laughs> yeah. If somebody was doing that to you, then that meant that they loved you. I think you stopped being as hardy as perhaps what we were when we were younger, which is, you know, you just laugh it off. You mm. don't get too deep. Anxiety wasn't really a word when we were children. No, it wasn't something that you ever actually had to face. The thing for me is, and the way that I've always dealt with things, and I don't know if this is something that most people can relate to, but I'd like to think that you can in some ways, regardless of whether you consider yourself to have anxiety or not. But there's there's almost like in the face of adversity, I will push through it and mm -hmm. go harder rather than sit back and allow myself to fall victim to it. And that stepping stone in 2018 was that moment where I realised everything is so wrong and all I kept telling myself was something's going to change. Sorry, but if you hear, heard a click, then it was my ankles. <laughs> I do apologise. <laughs> I had a few injuries in 2020, 2021. It was a slow time. Um, ignore the ankle clicking. So, yes, my approach to all of this was fight through it and recognising that I needed to change something, even though everything was telling me it's scary, it's frightening, but I knew in my heart that something had to be done as a result. And I think my outward expression of going, I feel extremely frightened and everything's annoying me and everything's just too much now is my way of just getting it out of my system and saying, I need something to change. I'm just put, sort of putting that mm -hmm. perspective in as to why, you know, even when you said, I don't think I can tell you that it's going to be okay. I did need that hardened approach. I did need that response. What that did for me was look internally and go, right, what do I need to do then? Mm-hmm. I mean, at the time, my no one thought can say was, me. I'm pretty sure it will be. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm like, let's say 98%, but, you know, my, I'm, I've got an analyst brain. So I'm like, well, you know, if we run all of that, <laughs> anything could happen. You know, a donkey could fly out in the street, you know, a cat could come off a roof. Okay, here's another question for yeah. me. When did you know, now this could be at any stage mm. at all, but when did you know you were going to do Frida Rome. Oh my God. There's a lot of stages. There's a lot of stages. At. I'll tell you where it was for me. Yeah, you tell me. We had quite a long warm up process to this. Mm -hmm. I used to have another business and I worked in a co working space. So this is sort of now we're talking 2019 time. Mm -hmm. Natalie was flying over and we were going to try and test our working relationship. In that big co working space, Natalie chose to tell the guys on the registration area to tell Rebecca that her stripper had arrived. Now, what followed was, let's say, a semi-awkward scene. There was sort of a shout down the back of the office. There's a few people in the office at this point. You know, <laughs> nobody's particularly interested in my personal life. Um, and there's a shout down saying, Rebecca, your stripper's arrived. <laughs> and Nat walks in and sort of feigns a strip, tries to put on a bit of a show, but then is interrupted by a disgruntled dog who's having none of it. It was <laughs> it was pretty much, it was a, a comedy of errors. Yeah. Everybody in there's not bothered. In fact, everybody in there's probably embarrassed, but I wasn't. I appreciated the fanfare, or at least, you know, the attempt. If the dog hadn't have cut you short, I think it would have been a good show. But I knew when you arrived and you walked in and you, you made the choice of that announcement... Uh, and we had a big hug at the time and it was just like, oh, oh, you know, finally, I'm back in my lane. Yeah. I remember saying at one point to some of those people in that office, well, we're making handbags. And it felt like I was, it was all lies coming off my tongue. Because <laughs> we hadn't made a handbag. I hadn't made a handbag. And for whatever reason, I'm like, well, this is not what I do. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying it and through sheer nonsense of saying it, just by saying it was enough to start building the confidence to think this it's is possible. It's a classic fake it to make it. It is. Yeah. Without any further thought on the matter and just continue through. And I think that is also the way I do and how we've ended up being what we are is because I've just said it or I've done it. And then just by the doing or the saying, it turns out to be that we are it. Okay. So this is not so much about... Um, the story, but I think this is something that people have asked me, and obviously we got asked this on Dragon's Den. There'll be more about Dragon's Den later on. We're literally doing everything up to before we started. There'll be a whole podcast on Dragon's Den mm. alone. But I think a lot of people wonder why we put erotic stories in handbags. And I can remember the moment that you said it. You were by the coffee machine in the said co-working space, 
And I only thought about this today. But why did you suggest that we put erotic stories in handbags? <laughs> Do you remember when you were a kid and you were given something to do and it was fun and you didn't really have to think too much about it? It was just like, and then we can do this. And yeah, and yeah, and yeah. And you just, yeah, yes, had that and. energy behind it. Yeah. It had that energy behind it, yeah. Had you thought about it before you said it? No. Do you know what the trigger was? Because all I remember is that you were stood by a coffee machine and it wasn't a particularly sexy environment. I've got a right in bone in my body and I want to do something with it. And I never really had any more thought than that. We were going down this channel of making these amazing vegan handbags and it didn't come as a logical thought, but for some reason I just thought, well, yeah, we'll just put an erotic story in the bag then. Mm -hmm. Because why not? I just thought it'd be a lovely thing to have inside a bag. And we actually did go ahead and do that. Yeah. And everybody has loved that side of the bag. Oh, God. Obviously, yeah. not everybody on TV, but, <laughs> but the majority of customers who are sinners also get why we were excited by that concept and of mm. course all I can say and I made it very simple when we were on Dragon's Den is that I just knew when you said it I was like I want to buy that bag yeah and therefore we'll make it and also for me I think I love combining this very material object that everybody knows a handbag obviously we make them differently but also putting some art into that and obviously with the story it's sort of mm. literature but we know we have other ideas of yep. incorporating erotic art in there as well. I think that's why it works for me. Yeah. I mean, it goes back to I could have walked into that room just having not seen you for however long to, you know, to say hi. Or I could have come in and said, your stripper's here. It's like, <laughs> what's the level up? How do we level up just the entry or the input? And that goes across the board. Mm -hmm. Making Frida Roam a thing mm -hmm. as not being an easy task. Could say that. Yeah. It's something that we both have chosen to follow our intuition on. Yeah. So how important has your gut feeling been on the, the decisions that we've made? For me, I feel like I've been on a journey of honing my intuition and now I make decisions so mm. much quicker and easier because I don't engage my head I'm not really interested in what that says. Mm -hmm. I literally go with how I feel, if I feel good about it, if I get a good feeling about it. Logically, it may not be the best thing to do, but I don't care. I just follow my gut. Mm -hmm. And I think you've done a similar mm -hmm. sort of thing. Obviously, you have made some major changes. Yep. I don't know how much of those you want to talk about. Yeah, we can. But we can wind back to 2019 and... Natalie and I had been working together. We'd been looking at fabrics. We'd been trying everything to try and find something that fitted what we were trying to do ethically and would deliver the luxury product that we wanted. And we actually never found it at that time. Mm -hmm. We thought we were on the path to it, but we weren't 100% happy with everything. We knew that we had to go on. In fact, we made a bag and it was terrible. <laughs> Absolutely terrible. Maybe one day we'll put it up on the it's website. It's going to have a yeah, showcase. Yeah, yeah. It'll have a showcase. Yeah. I'll have a party and you can swing the bag around. <laughs> you can laugh at it. Or you can get in the bag. It was that big. Yeah, yeah. You can, <laughs> you can do a sack in race in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, we had a great summer mm -hmm. and we'd flown out to different places trying to find manufacturers before we knew we wanted to make in the UK, but we tried everywhere else. You were due to leave. Mm -hmm. You'd obviously said that you weren't willing to come to Manchester to start the business here previously because you lived in Australia. So yep. for those who don't know, Natalie had been living in Australia for 13 years. Yep. So we sort of knew each other from sort of 19 to 25 and then she went off. And so it was understandable that you didn't want to trash your life over there and come back to the UK. In fact, you were pretty certain that you wouldn't want to do that because it would be like a step back. But by the time we'd done two months together, what were your thoughts? So by the end of the time that I was here for that little two, three month stint and I was heading back to Australia, prior to which I'd said, never going to return to Manchester, it's a step back, etc. I'd had clarity. The gut had kicked in. I knew that the thought of going home to Oz at that point was turning my stomach a little bit. And that has nothing to do with the place or the people. I love everybody that was there. I still have a huge amount of respect and love for my then husband. But something told me this wasn't right. And for many, many years, I remember this feeling in 
daft relationships I'd had where it's like, mm, or you know, <laughs> for all the Yeesh. boyfriends that they just like, mm, my parents would have desperately wanted me to get rid of. And it took me so long to get past that. Whereas this point, and I think having that little bit of light ever gap before I made that step onto the plane, I prepped my then husband and said, listen, we need to talk as soon as I get back. He probably felt it before I even knew, but he gave me that space to learn and figure it out. And it was just, if I say this, like how I did, if I say I'm doing this business, if I'm going to be free to roam, somehow that happens. And that's my gut instinct. It's like, as soon as I say it, it comes out of my mouth and it's just, it's out there. I hear it back on myself. I'm done. That's, that's settled. And that's how I think I felt. I fell into it and followed that path because realizing that by saying it and it not being met with absolute confusion or disgust or anything from other parties, they go, oh, okay. Then I can realize it myself is a actual valid idea and thought. The feeling of gut instinct, it's, it's mad that we didn't ever follow that before enough as we do now. I mean, you could talk about nutrition being that as well. Mm, we all say yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, there's a brain in your gut, right? But to feed it and to listen to it and to nurture it, it seems sad. I think that's interesting about nutrition because actually I had a conversation with someone last night about this. Yeah. She had uh, become vegan, but she only became vegan because she was actually trying to solve her health problems. Mm -hmm. So she was incredibly tired and she happened to see some guy in Australia. I don't know his name. Sorry, everyone else might know him. He's very, very famous. But he had cured cancer, I think, with yeah. his veganism. And she said, it's the first time I'd heard about selfish veganism. Prior to that, I just thought vegans were weird and I'd never even thought of diet and nutrition. So I used to eat KFCs, blah, blah, blah. And I think back to like my early life, I never ate for fuel. No. I never ate for health benefits. Pure joy. I just, I mean, it was pure joy. Love my mother's cooking. Indulgence. Um, so yeah, so that is interesting that you've sort of made that point. Mm. And maybe that was it as well. We had obviously started that transition, you a year before me becoming vegan. Uh, who knows? If that had something to do with it, I don't know. But obviously I've, I've seen there's many books on this, if anyone's interested, about how your brain is in your gut in a way. And there's a lot to do with how you can nourish that with, with nutrition. Who knows if that, us changing to go into a vegan diet, may have allowed us that bit more of an understanding about what I've got to do Well, interestingly, I think it did, it was a big thing for me because I would have always have classed myself as someone who has conviction. Mm -hmm. So if I say I'm going to do it, I do it. Yeah. And I feel like I got to a place in my early thirties where I felt a bit weaker in terms of getting things done, mm -hmm. like hitting major goals. Maybe I was tired. I'd built a business anyway already. It was like, the nagging voice in my head was saying, you're not going to be happy without the conviction. Mm. So although life right now may be very easy, you've built a lovely life for yourself, you want to fight for something, you're not going to be happy without that conviction. And funnily mm. enough, going vegan, which I did overnight, and I then had to board a plane to Thailand the next day, and I asked the one of the air hostesses, have you got any vegan food? I knew nothing about veganism at that point, but I hoped they would know more than I did. <laughs> and she basically just tuttered, looked at the sky and threw a banana at me. <laughs> and I didn't like bananas. <laughs> However, this is something else. It didn't matter because this is all I had to eat. Yeah. So I was, maybe this is my working class roots again. I was very, very grateful that I was just not being stupid and going, oh, I don't like a banana. No. I'm going to eat the banana. I don't care if I don't like it because my commitment to the cause is so strong at this time, I'll starve before I eat meat again. Yeah. It was like, and just to know that I could do that and be committed to it, I think was a big starting point to knowing that whatever else I chose to commit to was going to get that same level of conviction. Yeah. So we've touched on a few things there. You've not really even fleshed out your move back no. and what that took to come and start Frida Rome. Potentially we'll hit that again next time. But I think in the next episode, you're going to start to hear more about how we start to build the business mm -hmm. and how we ended up in a dragon's lair. So join us in part two for more of the story. Thank you. Thank you.